Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. United Nations victory has been won. The war is over. Peace is here. The crowd of two million review the greatest parade of victorious arms ever witnessed. This is the news that electrified the world. Unconditional surrender of a new world of peace. Today the guns are silent. The skies no longer rain there. The entire world lies quietly in peace. Infantrymen once again hit the road toward Korea's capital city of Seoul. <laughs> U.S. Marines were ordered into the Dominican Republic. As a rebel, meanwhile, the U.S. Marines have also taken center stage in South Vietnam. This is what the war in Vietnam is all about. The first wave of Marines landed at Grenada. In some 1,200 U.S. Marines would land at Grenada for several days. The Bolivians were terrified during last night's heavy bombing raid. Breaking story, President Bush's decision to neutralize Panama's General Manuel Noriega. Saddam Hussein's reign of terror is over. Of the war in Iraq. Since World War II, we have seen a dramatic escalation in United States military actions around the globe, ranging from missile strikes and rapid troop deployments to all-out wars and occupations. The reasons for these military interventions have varied, each involving complex geopolitical interests in different parts of the world at different times in U.S. history. But the public face of these wars has not reflected this complexity. Over the past five decades, deliberation and debate about U.S. military actions have largely been left to a closed circle of elite Washington policymakers, politicians and bureaucrats whose rationales for war have come into public view only with the release of leaked or declassified documents, often years after the bombs have been dropped and the troops have come home. In real time, Officials have explained and justified these military operations to the American people by withholding crucial information about the actual reasons and potential costs of military action, again and again choosing to present an easier version of war's reality, a steady and remarkably consistent storyline designed not to inform, but to generate and maintain support and enthusiasm for war. Nationally syndicated columnist and author Norman Solomon began to notice the basic contours of this official storyline during the war in Vietnam. As a teenager, I read about the war in Vietnam as it escalated. I saw the footage on television. In combat, there are no niceties. A dead enemy soldier is simply an object to be examined for documents, then removed as quickly as possible, sometimes crudely. People that I knew began to go to Vietnam in uniform of the U.S. military. And as time went on, I began to wonder, particularly as I became draft age, about the truthfulness of the statements coming from the White House and top officials in Washington. We fight for the principle of self-determination, that the people of South Vietnam should be able to choose their own course, choose it in free election, without violence, without terror, and without fear. And through that process, I began to really wonder about 
whether we were getting more truth or lies. In the years since, Solomon has focused his attention on a set of striking parallels between the selling of the Vietnam War and the way presidents have rallied public support for subsequent military actions. Looking back on the Vietnam War, as I did many times, I had a very eerie feeling that while the names of the countries changed, and of course each circumstance was different, there were some parallels that cried out for examination. Rarely, if ever, does a war just kind of fall down from the sky. The foundation needs to be laid, and the case is built, often with deception. In the background was the growing struggle between two great powers to shape the post-war world. Already an iron curtain had dropped around Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria. It can't happen here. Well, this is what it looks like if it should. Police is hustled off to jail. Public utilities are seized by Fifth Column an editor who operates under a free press. He goes to jail too. And Fighters will account for some of the enemy, but some will get through to your home. The use of propaganda to arouse public support for war is not new. Leaders throughout history have turned to propaganda to transform populations understandably wary of the costs of war into war's most ardent supporters, invoking images of nationalism and channeling fear and anger toward perceived enemies and threats. And in the United States since World War II, government attempts to win public support for military actions have followed a similar pattern. That we are living in an era marked by the growth of socialism, its basic godless philosophy, Lying. Dirty. Its goal of world conquest. Shrewd. Godless. Its insidious tactics. Murderous. Determined. And its cunning strategy. It's an international criminal conspiracy. It's the same sort of message that's utilized today and often identical techniques. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. These are barbaric people, servants of evil. The cult of evil. A monumental struggle of good versus evil. But good will prevail. Whether it's the Soviet Union or Al-Qaeda, it provides a way to legitimize U.S. plans for war. On high alert from biggest... We have the comparisons between uh, the enemy leader and Hitler. President Bush calls Saddam Hussein a little Hitler again today. We're dealing with Hitler revisited. Bin Laden and his terrorist allies have made their intentions as clear as Lenin and Hitler before them. We don't get information that would help us put the images in perspective. This mad dog of the Middle East, I find he's not only a barbarian, but he's flaky. The drug indicted, drug related, indicted dictator of Panama. And to support their claim that Noriega was out of control, ghoulish evidence of satanic practices with dead animals that one official called kinky. Saddam Hussein is a homicidal dictator who is addicted to weapons of mass destruction. And as Aldous Huxley said long ago, it's more powerful often to leave things out than to tell lies. For instance, quite often the U.S. government directly helped the dictators that were now being told must be overthrown. And it's that selectivity of history that's a very effective form of propaganda. This selective view of reality buttressed by these fear-based appeals, represents a larger pre-war pattern. The repeated claim that the United States uses military force only with great reluctance. We still seek no wider war. The United States does not start fights. America does not seek conflict. I don't like to use military force. Our nation enters this conflict reluctantly. And only for the most virtuous of reasons. First and foremost, to spread freedom 
and democracy. We want nothing for ourselves, only that the people of South Vietnam be allowed to guide their own country in their own way. The rhetoric of democracy is part of the process of convincing people that even though unpleasant things must be done sometimes in its name, like bombing other countries, democracy is really what it's about. The United States has been engaged in an effort to stop the advance of communism in Central America by doing what we do best, by supporting democracy. And it's almost as though repeating it enough times makes it so. Our cause of liberty, our cause of freedom, our cause of compassion and understanding. People want democracy, peace, and the chance for a better life in dignity and freedom. We want to lift lives around the world, not take them. These are forms of propaganda that are insidious because they tug at our heartstrings. We must get the Kosovar refugees home safely. Minefields will have to be cleared. Homes destroyed by Serb forces will have to be rebuilt. Homeless people in need of food and medicine. Of course we want to help other people. These are propaganda messages that say, uh, don't just think of yourself. America can't just be selfish. It makes bombing other people ultimately seem like an act of kindness, of altruism. Today, our armed forces joined our NATO allies in airstrikes against Serbian forces responsible for the brutality in Kosovo. We are upholding our values, protecting our interests, and advancing the cause of peace. Belgrade's largest heating plant up in flames. But even as planes of the multinational forces attack Iraq, I prefer to think of peace, not war. If my motives are pure, then the fact that I'm killing people may not be too upsetting. As a matter of fact, it may indicate that I'm killing people for very good reasons. America will stand with the allies of freedom to support democratic movements in the Middle East and beyond with the ultimate goal of ending tyranny in our world. And so you have kind of the high ground president with the lofty motives being proclaimed. We're told that peace is being sought, alternatives to war are being explored. And that's kind of, you know, the official story. And I am continuing and I am increasing the search for every possible path to peace. Whether we're talking about President Johnson or President Nixon or the president today, you have one chief executive after another in the White House saying how much they love peace and hate war. We maintain our strength in order to deter and defend against aggression, to preserve freedom and peace. No one, friend or foe, should doubt our desire for peace. The United States wants peace. We seek peace. We strive for peace. Every president of the last half century has gone out of his way to say that he wanted peace and wanted to avoid war. I pledged in my campaign for the presidency to end the war in a way that we could win the peace. Even while ordering military action. And I still think we ought to take the dice off now. I think the last brown people got So you have this paradox in a way of the president who has just ordered massive military violence and a lethal action by the Pentagon turning around and saying, I want to oppose violence and promote peace. I respect your idealism. I share your concern for peace. I want peace as much as you do. Actually, war becomes perpetual when it's used as a rationale for peace. We cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun, that could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. As Americans, we like to think that we're not subjected to propaganda from our own government. 
certainly that we're not subjected to propaganda that's trying to drag the country.